one which was intended to be given by Peter Kearns from the OECD, unfortunately, has to be skipped due to other obligations by him. And we now come to um, Wolf. We now come to Wandel Wollleben from the BASF in Germany, and the floor is yours. Thank you. Well, welcome uh, to the uh, last talk of this wonderful conference. Um, I thank the organizers, of course, for inviting me. Um, they originally invited me for a very uh, technical issue, um, but then they placed me into this session. So I somehow changed the weight. I condensed uh, the very technical stuff on centrifuges in this so you won't be disappointed, you will get what was promised in the abstract. But fortunately, I have uh, permission to um, talk about the results uh, from the JSC and Eurocolor round robin, um, how to classify pigments according to the EC nano definition. I will also present uh, some of our own results on that. I hope to comment um, on uh, our first experiences with the nano-specific reach guidance. Um, and. The issue of life cycle of nanomaterials has been praised already by Tom and others, and uh, again, I'll just be able to comment on it due to time. BASF is the largest chemical company of the world. Um, we had in 2011 a turnover of uh, 73 billion um, euros, and it's 10% up in 2012. We are just above 100,000 people. What is listed here is not the Business units of BSF, it's the growth fields. So this means those areas where we believe that chemistry and chemical systems can make a huge advantage in future. So for instance, if you want cars that have that are um, electrical powered by, um, powered by batteries, and if you want a longer um, distance that you can drive, you will not get around nanostructures. If you want these cars to be lightweight, you will not get around nanostructures. The same applies to novel energy sources, and that's the key point of this slide here, nanotechnology and material systems, it's universal. There are different materials for all these applications, of course. Almost none of them is a nanopowder. Some of them are nano slurries. Most of them are composite materials. So the diversity is very high. So obviously we need to find a way to deal with that diversity. And now we have the EC nano definition. We need to measure for thousands, even tens of thousands of materials, whether or not their number size distribution has a median, so a D50, below or above 100 nanometers. That is a huge challenge. Mostly uh, you assume that electron micro microscopy is maybe expensive, but at least a viable solution. That's not the case. Electron microscopy is expensive, but it's not always the solution. Um, it's easy to show that, for instance, you have these um, capillary assemblies. How do you count these small particles in the presence of the large particles here? How do you count particles that, even for electron microscopy, you need to disperse to some extent? So you need alternative te um, technologies. In a systematic way, you could arrange it in this way. You could measure ensembles, so mostly average values, which obviously is of no value if you need to measure a median, so you need to know what is below and what is above 100 nanometers. You can classify, so you physically separate the small particles from the large circle particles and then quantify each of these fractions. This is, for instance, what's done in centrifuges, in field for fractionation, also in classical sieving. You can directly count by single particle techniques, like and the nanoparticle tracking, although of course many particles are counted at the same time, but each particle individually. And ideally you would do maybe something like a classified counting. So separate physically and then count. That is not available so far. This is in an early stage of technology development. This is available and we will check whether or not it applies and this is available too. Since I promised to say something about centrifuges, I have to start with Theodor Svetberg. He was a S Swedish professor and he was awarded the Nobel Prize in Chemistry in 1926. 
for the invention of the ultracentrifuge. And this is his original um, paper in JAX, and it contains the key elements of what is still in use today. The idea is that you measure the distribution of size of particles, so it's exactly what we need, by measuring the concentration as a function of the distance from the axis of rotation during centrifuging. So you look at particles while they separate during centrifuging. That's the key point. And he did this in this paper with gold particles of 21 uh, millimicron. That's 21 nanometers. So it's not new. Um, nobody can claim that um, this is new. What's new is that it's available in, in um, commercial equipment. You can buy it from Brookhaven Instruments, from CPS, uh, from LUM, or from Beckman. And the main difference between these is, first of all, the maximum rotational speed that they can make that determines the smallest particles you can measure. And unfortunately, it also determines the price. Um, the price of investment scales roughly linear with um, the rotational speed. So you are somewhere in the 50,000s here and somewhere in the uh, 300,000s here. What's also different is the optical systems. The sample instruments mostly use a vis turbidity. And of course, you will remember turbidity is something that comes from the refractive index and the particle size via me um, scattering. So you need to know something about the optical properties to derive an exact size distribution from this. The more involved instruments can have different optics, and I have no time to go into any details. I'll just tell you that you can have UV vis absorption, and actually you can measure the entire um, uh, UV vis absorption of nano one nanometer particles separated from the different absorption of two nanometer particles. That's something that we developed with the Max Planck Institutes. And you can have interference from Beckmann, which is great because it measures the refractive index difference. This is independent of size. It's independent of scattering efficiencies. And here, and this work is published also, we took bimodal mixtures of well-dispersed spherical particles. So it's a very simple case. And I'll show you how to read this graphic. Um, this means 50 nanometer particles, five weight percent, within a majority of 100 nanometer particles, which make up then 95 uh, weight percent. And the bars show how much is retrieved by the different instruments. The black bars are DLS. There is just one black bar. In most cases, by DLS, you don't see that there's a second component. Um, the gray bar is hydrodynamic chromatography, which is quite good because it always tells you, yes, there is a bimodal distribution. So you would know how to look further into it. And if you now go to the, um, it's actually the turbidity-based centrifuges, uh, it works quantitatively. It always tells you that there is a second component and it is just around 5% or in that case the 2% that you want to find. You can translate this also to the nanoparticle tracking analysis and Maybe you see it, here's the second component, this is the main component, here's the second component. It is better than DLS, but in our assessment it still fails in 70% of the cases. So it's far from being a plug-in method. Convert it to number percent, because that's what we need for the um, uh, nano definition. This is what you want to find, and this is what we determine um, by the centrifuges. So it works in a quantitative fashion, but, and that's really key to say it again, well-dispersed spherical particles of known chemical composition. It's a really easy case. Now, going beyond the easy cases, uh, there was a collaboration ongoing for now, I believe, um, more than one year certainly, maybe one, and a, one year and a few months, between um, several companies under the umbrella of Eurocolor and um, the uh, JSC Institute in Ispra. And the idea was that we have eight materials, we have nine labs, but everybody follows the same dispersion SOP. And then we look at the performance of five different methods. Electron microscopy, laser diffraction, the centrifugal um, uh, uh, liquid, um, uh, 
well, the simple uh, centrifuges, the DLS and the volume specific surface area because that's of course, as you may know, um, a proxy in the nano definition. These are electron microscopic images of the test particles. All these are coloristic um, pigments except for the two titanium dioxides which um, are of course white pigments and you have the silicon dioxide which is typically a filler. So these are yellow pigments, um, we have a red, a blue pigment and a metallic pigment and you can al also see that we have both organic and inorganic, we have needles, we have particles, we have platelets, so it represents already quite a diversity. Just for one material, I show you the results here. This is um, um, an um, iron oxide uh, material. This is the TEM image. This is an image evaluation of um, 400 particles from the TEM, and it clearly shows you that the D50 is below 100 nanometers. So this is clearly a nanomaterial. If you now look at um, the results from the different test labs, and this is the medium di diameter, so the D50. This is where we want to be, this is TEM. This is from the centrifuges. Many of them do well, one doesn't. This is from the DLS, not so bad, surprisingly. And this is from laser diffraction. You see that there is a strong difference here between the weight metrics and the number metrics. This is because it's a very broad distribution, I'll show you in a second. And clearly, by laser diffraction, you have no uh, possibility to identify this correctly as a nanomaterial. This is what it looks like. Um, laser diffraction gives you a huge distribution. So quite obviously, this uniform dispersion protocol was not adapted to this material. Now, you can imagine that you have a specific dispersion protocol for each material, but this is not a standardized method then. But what's really surprising is, look at this curve here. It has mainly a peak at 20 microns and actually 0.5 weight percent around 100 nanometers. But after conversion to a number metrics, it seems to be exclusively nanomaterials. So you can interpret this in several ways, but one way is to say that um, the intrinsic um, detection range of the method is insufficient because it stops somewhere here. So that the software of the distributor has built in this block and it also tells you that dispersion is an issue. You transform from intensity to volume to number metrics. You have two conversions and this is just a, an error that multiplies. These are the results from the um, centrifuges. So for each pigment, we list how many labs detect the D50 below 100 meters or above 100 nanometers. And if you take the average over these labs, it is quite good. It comes to the correct conclusion. But quite obviously, there's a very high probability of a false positive or false negative evaluation if you just have one lab and this would be the real case. You would have just one lab assessing it. This is the volume specific surface area. All the values from all people, from all the pigments. And this is what the, um, where's the mean value? Here are the mean values. And I remind you that the uh, discriminator is at 60, 60 square meters per cubic centimeter. So some of these materials are way above the threshold some are just at the threshold and some are clearly below. And in fact, it matches well to the expectations from the TEM evaluation. However, Q and A's and the um, nano definition are very strict. Um, VSSA is not allowed to identify a nanomaterial, to identify a not nanomaterial. You can only identify a nanomaterial. So these are our conclusions. Um, in uh, a uh, slightly um, politically polished um, uh, way. So you, you, need to, you need to come to consensus in, in this uh, uh, round. It's, it, it was not so easy. So we claim that at present, we do not have a single simple and commonly available method. 
at least none that works after redispersion in liquids. As an interim approach, before we have any guidance, um, and hopefully this also helps to, to, to shape the guidance, we will need a tiered approach, simple screening and then a more complicated um, uh, validation. The sample state is critical. The dispersion was really the road blocker in this whole thing. So either we find a, a way to get across the dispersion issues or we work without dispersion. And we also remark that in most cases, those labs who know the, uh, the material perform best. So to know what the material is, of course, helps. So far for this round robin, I would like to say a few words on as tested characterization. Um, actually, just very few words because many of what uh, I'm doing in this area has been presented by Andrea Hase in her talk um, the day before yesterday. I'll just make a remark. Most people don't really acknowledge that nanomaterials, if they are agglomerated, are not solid spheres. They are, of course, hollow, fluffy agglomerates that you would normally describe by a fractional dimension. So these are fractal structures. And it's quite easy and straightforward to incorporate this, for instance, into a centrifuge evaluation. You can do the math. It's just one page of math, and it's described. So you can measure correct diameters that take care of the uh, agglomerate uh, structure, which is important, really. And people should do it also on light scattering. Um, very few people do. Um, because, of course, me correction is different if you assume spheres instead of hollow fractal agglomerates. And this has been applied to several systems already. Since the guidance is there, and it was mentioned earlier today in the session um, on uh, uh, regulation in the other um, audience, um, we just took it. So we um, performed the entire FISCAM characterization on 20 endpoints on 15 materials. And again, this stuff is in print. It's not yet out, but it will be soon. Um, so we looked at size-related endpoints, surface-related endpoints, and as tested or in situ endpoints. It works quite well. It's not so complicated if you have the labs to install this guidance. So we are quite happy that this guidance exists because it tells us which endpoints to address by which method. But if you do it, you will find that there's a lot of redundancy. Some endpoints are determined three or four times by the different methods. So this is clearly a potential to trim it down to make it easier to implement, more cost efficient. I would say a few words about the life cycle of composites. As has been mentioned before, what consumers get into their hands are not nanopowders and nano slurries. Most of them are solid materials like thermoplastics, like coatings, paints, construction materials. They have an internal nanostructure. Maybe they have embedded nanomaterials. And this is what is depicted here. Imagine this is a composite of CNT in a polymer matrix. You can think about mechanical in, uh, energy input. What will happen to such a material when it gets degraded by mechanical input? What will happen when it gets chemically degraded? I don't have the time to go into details. Um, some of our work is, uh, is published. I just show you one example, which I find nice because it's, uh, it gives you a mechanistic insight. If you look at the uh, stuff that the fragments that are released by sanding, so by a very high shear um, with abrasion paper, then often you find protrusions. So you see that here. This is data from uh, our friends at the University of Iowa in NIOSH. It's an epoxy with embedded CNTs, and you see that these CNTs are visible on the surface. So you could also imagine that they have an effect if they ever come physiologically into contact. Oops, sorry. Um, the same is seen for cement CNT composites. We do not see it for polyoxymethylene, which is a polymer, and we do not, do not see it for thermoplastic polyurethane, which again is a polymer. Here you see the overall fragments. Here you see a detail. And if you don't believe the morphology, 
you would maybe believe the photoelectron spectroscopy because it's quantitative and it tells you that there's just no CNTs on the surface, although we know that they are in there. And it scales with the elongation at break. This is a very soft material, 600% elongation, 27%, 5%, 1%. So the polymer can reflow during the separation process. And this, of course, is one of those things that we need as manufacturers because it tells us in which kind of application a material will behave in which way. Generally, the probability of release is low. But we do have these emerging structure release relationships. It's really just emerging, no more than that. We know that the brittleness of the matrix has an effect. We know that the quality has a strong effect. If there are agglomerates which are not covered um, by, by polymer, they will easily release. We are a little concerned about chemically degraded matrix um, under constant uh, stress. So this is stuff that we uh, investigate now in the framework of the NanoGem project with partners and in the framework of Marina, again, with partners. But the most interesting project in this whole game right now is not in Europe, it's in the US. It's the Nano Release um, Project. The Nano Release Project is all about validating methods. Because we have these emerging relationships, we trust that now is a good time to validate those methods to come to a joint understanding of which lab simulation is useful to simulate machining, to simulate production, to simulate outdoor use. And what's special about this project is the people that are involved. Some of them are here today. Trey Thomas gave a talk earlier. Um, he is one of the key drivers uh, from uh, the uh, agencies. And if you just, I mean, I can't read it, but if you just look at this, and if you look at the affiliations, you'll see that there's lots of Health Canada, lots of Environment Canada, EPA in there, and then you have all the American and European companies, both American, Canadian, Australian, European academics. So the fact alone that we speak about this is great, but what's even greater is that I'm convinced that we will come to a conclusion, we will start interlab validation um, uh, uh, round robins this year so that we can establish validated methods. So to conclude, um, for the EC nano definition, we looked at it on nice systems, we looked at it on nasty but real world systems, commercial pigments, and no easy method works. This is bad news. The dispersion is a real problem, but also electron microscopy is not in general simply applicable. As BASF, um, not as part of the JSC round robin, uh, we would like to think about grouping approaches because VSSA is the only value that we already have. Many, many materials are specified by their specific surface. So it's easy to take these values and make a simple screening and then you can validate by electron microscopy or other methods later on. For well dispersed materials, the centrifuges work well, DLS fails, NTA does not quite fail, but still needs some development. Uh, I told you just with a few words how to deal with fractal agglomerates. I did not speak a lot about adsorption isotherms and the size growth of coronas that we do for in situ work. I commented that there is really high value, but still quite a bit of redundancy in the reach guidance. Um, and I stressed that we need validated methods to assess the release throughout the life, life cycle. And with that, I thank my internal and external collaborators, people who give um, public funding, and for the toxicologists who are disappointed by this talk, he has some more material. And with that, I thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. Are there any questions? Question or comment? Okay, then thank you very much once again. <laughs>